Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. My name is Cameron Cushman. I am a manager of entrepreneurship here at the Kauffman Foundation. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, but we focus really on two main issues here at the foundation, education and entrepreneurship. And I think an event like this uh, uh, really plays between our two missions. I think we're all going to learn something today. We've got some real experts uh, who are great Kansas Cityans that are going to teach us something about crowdfunding. And obviously, I think crowdfunding is one of the biggest things to happen uh, to entrepreneurship, startups, new firm formation, however you want to phrase it, in a long, long time, uh, maybe even since sort of the adoption of the internet. So I think crowdfunding is going to be a big thing, and uh, it was pretty clear when we announced this event that there was a lot of demand and interest for this. Uh, we had capacity for about 150, and it sold out within about a day. So uh, I anticipate we'll have a lot of latecomers. You'll see the, you'll see the chairs uh, filling up pretty quickly. There are still a few seats down front, maybe not, but feel free to just come on up. A couple of housekeeping things. We have coffee and water and stuff in the back. Feel free to help yourself. Uh, bathrooms, if you need to use them, are behind this wall right here. Um, and with that, I'll just kind of jump into a quick introduction of what we're going to be doing today. Uh, super excited about this event. I, I want to just give a couple of disclaimers right off the bat. One is uh, we want this to be completely platform agnostic. You're going to hear a lot about several different platforms today, but this is not an endorsement of any of these platforms. You as a startup, you as someone who's interested in this, you have to pick the platform that works the best for you. Uh, we even have um, uh, the founder of, of one specific crowdfunding platform here with us today who's going to talk about uh, his experience with crowdfunding. Um, let me just kind of lay the land for you a little bit of how this is going to work. We're starting uh, at 10 today. Uh, up first, we're going to have Jace Wilson from Neighborly, uh, a crowdfunding platform for civic projects, talk to us about, kind of give us the overview of crowdfunding, what it means, what's about to change, what does the future look like. I wanted to have Jace here for really for two reasons. I see Jace as probably one of the uh, best experts on crowdfunding here in Kansas City. And two, he gave a fabulous presentation at South by Southwest in Austin in November on this very subject. And uh, if, if he's half as good as he was then, which I'm sure he will be, uh, it will be dynamite. So I think we're all really going to learn a ton. Then after that, we're just going to have a couple of questions, really specifically just about Jace's presentation. Then we're going to roll into um, uh, Claude and Jason from a company called Trelly, who did a successful crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter that really launched their um, tech hardware business into existence. Um, and they're going to talk to you a little bit about their experience with Kickstarter. Was it good or bad? Would they do it again? Was it the right platform for them? They're going to answer some of those questions from a very practical sense about their experience with a specific crowdfunding platform. We'll take a couple of specific questions from them. And then we're going to roll right into our final speaker, Nate Allen. He's a uh, video game creation and data visualization expert uh, with a company called Four First Names here in town. And as a side project, he went and scraped a bunch of data off of Kickstarter. Uh, one of the things that drives our research and policy shop crazy is that there's not a lot of data on crowdfunding. How successful is it? What platforms are being used? How much money is raised? All those sort of questions that our, that our data geeks uh, love to ask are really not available uh, from a data perspective. So Nate went in and just scraped a lot of data off of it, and he's going to show us what that data can mean for you and your startup or the crowdfunding uh, universe in general. Um, so with that, I don't think I have a whole lot else to say um, other than if you do want to tweet about the event today, uh, crowdfundkc is the hashtag that we've selected. And it uh, looks like everybody but Jace put their name up there. So Jace, I'll write you up there in just a second. Uh, so feel free to tweet away. Um, we do have a hard stop at 1130 today because we have to move the cameras. This presentation is being recorded, but it's not being live streamed. At 11.30, we're going to move the cameras over to uh, Slava Rubin's presentation at lunch, uh, which is going to start probably a little afternoon. So at 11.30, you'll have a chance to interact with these guys one-on-one, -on -one, catch a break, go to the bathroom, whatever that looks like, and then we'll be in the town square room, um, which is just on the other side of the house, and I'll give you more instructions uh, how that's going to go at the end of this presentation. And that will go until probably 1 o'clock or so. Uh, we're super excited to have Slava here today. Uh, Indiegogo is obviously one of the uh, you know, most recognized crowdfunding platforms, also one of the longest running. And I think we're all going to learn a lot from him as well. I think the title of his remarks, I'm probably going to screw it up, is uh, how to raise uh, $1 million for your startup in 30 days or less, which pretty darn compelling uh, topic. So um, anyway, so with that, let me introduce uh, Jace Wilson. He's a huge uh, community leader here in town, and his startup, Neighborly, 
uh, just actually won the Points of Light Accelerator, so we're super excited about that. He has gotten a lot of press, uh, and he'll tell you more about Neighborly through the process, uh, or through, in, through his presentation, but let's give a nice welcome for Jace Wilson. Hello? Okay. So um, thank you all for joining us here today. And uh, this is a pretty exciting topic. And if this uh, experiment of Cameron's and Kauffman Foundations proves anything, it's that there's a pent up demand in Kansas City to learn more about what we're going to be learning today. So uh, for this uh, intro presentation, I thought I would just walk us through sort of a 50,000 foot view of crowdfunding. Uh, from its origins and, and why it's so exciting uh, at this time. And if there's any questions along the way, please feel free and just stop me. We'll have the panel afterwards, but um, I'm going to try to breeze through some of these slides. So um, what's crowdfunding? I don't know. I Googled it. And Google tells me it's the practice of funding a project or a venture by raising many small amounts of money from a large number of people typically via the internet. Um, and if you look at the mentions graph, it has basically no mentions in the early 2000s, and it's basically going linear. So it's obviously a fancy new term for something that is needed. But I also think that maybe it's a fancy new term for a thing that we've been doing for centuries, and that's passing the hat around. So um, if you like to break things down into their simplest elements, you can think of crowdfunding as nothing more than passing the hat around using the internet to accelerate the effort. Um, and there's also, after a year and a half of doing a crowdfunding platform, uh, the thing that's become most obvious is that the money, uh, which seems like maybe that's the end objective of the campaign, is really just icing on a cake that consists of things like awareness and getting early adopters, you know, early buy-in, folks who feel like they're invested in, in your undertaking and help make it happen, who will uh, go to bat for you. So building that core team and getting the early market exposure that you need is uh, as valuable, if not more valuable, than the funds that you'd be raising. So if you can think of your campaign not just as a, as a way to raise money, but as a way to do these other things, then you have the right state of mind to make the most of crowdfunding. And we're going to hear from Slava Rubin, um, one of the fathers of the crowdfunding movement uh, later on today. But there is a quote of his that's worth sharing, and that's that in his assessment, crowdfunding takes down the gatekeepers. So in every realm that crowdfunding is touching, what we see is a rewiring of the power structures, of what controls the money flows. So you know, if you were a company pre-crowdfunding and you had a product, say you were doing manufacturing, you know what it took. It was uh, you know, having a great business plan, an excellent reputation, a bank or some investors that you could convince that it's worth doing. And then you have enormous amounts of capital expenditure up front to develop your operations. And then maybe, maybe, if you do your job right, uh, customers will buy your widget. With crowdfunding, what we see is a complete inversion of that model. And as you'll hear from the folks at Trelly, um, they've proven that it works, uh, and it can work very effectively, to basically pre-sell units directly to customers and capitalize uh, operations in the process. So um, it's worth noting, though, that crowdfunding is a neologism for not just one thing, but many things. And as near as we can tell, there are three major flavors to it. And it begins with perks-based crowdfunding. And then there's debt-based crowdfunding. Um, which is kind of the, the lesser known, less thought about version. And then there's the one that maybe most of you are here for today and that has the world sort of uh, 
on the edge of its seat waiting for the next uh, phase, and that is the equity crowdfunding that's about to become legal. So in the flavors, though, you have perks as basically more or less th thought of as a donation. The transaction is, is a contribution. Maybe there's something offered in return, uh, but it's not equity. You know, it's not a security in some thing. It's, it's maybe some uh, tangible product or your name on something. Um, but with debt and equity, those types of crowdfunding are regarded as investments. And so they're subject to regulations and things that you don't have in the perks-based world. So we'll start with perks, and I'm just going to breeze through a few examples of, of projects and, and mention the platforms that help make them happen along the way. Um, but depending on who you talk to, the perks-based crowdfunding concept on the internet came about in 2003 from a musician who was interested in finding a new way to fund uh, music. And the platform was called ArtistShare. Anybody heard of it? One, awesome. It, it's still around too. It still operates, and you can still use it. Um, there were some weird legal battles involving some crazy uh, musicians that, that rose to prominence in the late '80s, um, who thought they invented crowdfunding and patented it. But uh, those were struck down, and and we saw after that the rise of uh, Indiegogo and then Kickstarter, uh, which have become the, sort of the the mainstay in the perks-based world of crowdfunding. And with the perks-based world of crowdfunding, you can do things like raise over a million dollars to buy Nikola Tesla's lab and turn it into a museum. Or you can raise over $10 million to build a futuristic watch. Um, and notice that in this case, the goal of the campaign was $100,000. Um, this is an outlier, as, you, as Nate will tell you in his excellent presentation coming up. But um, it shows that there is scalability to this new model. You can do things like crowdfund a bridge, a footbridge in Rotterdam, plank by plank, by selling off uh, naming rights for individual planks. You can, if you're in Kansas City, the sort of philanthropic community that, that loves, then you can do things like raise money to help bring high-speed, low-cost internet to low-income communities. Um, so those are some examples of perks-based crowdfunding, and I think everybody in the room is probably familiar enough with that that we don't need to dwell on the model. Uh, basically, you know, the primary model is a tipping point uh, mechanic of ra set a goal and a date by which to raise the goal. Um, if you raise the goal, you get it. If you don't raise the goal, you don't get it. There are variations on that theme, but uh, that's pretty tried and true, and it has very little actually to do with the equity-based crowdfunding that the JOBS Act is about to release. So another model that's kind of off the radar is, is debt crowdfunding, and this, this is an interesting model to consider and to at least look further into, and really this, Kiva gave rise to this model, and this was uh, sort of micro-lending meets uh, you know, small businesses anywhere in the world and large numbers of people can give very small amounts of money and help enable entrepreneurs to do their thing. Um, Kiva had, uh, from its outset, a very al altruistic kind of approach, and, and it was intending to help bring money into uh, third world countries, especially where there was a, a really steep um, wall to climb to get capital. Um, and it was especially useful in a lot of cases. The interesting cases are of, of women entrepreneurs who are able to more or less transform their lives and the lives of their families uh, because they were freed from what Slava called the gatekeepers of, of the money for their small businesses. And that model is taking off for US-based businesses. Kiva has uh, launched Kiva Zip, but then there are also platforms that are emerging that are specifically designed to help people invest in the businesses that they want to see happen in a, a debt structure. So this would be in the form of a loan that has some terms of repayment. And typically it's not meant to be, it, it's not meant to be like some high return investment. 
it's meant to be something that you can do well for yourself and by doing good for others. So it's not as uh, attractive as a return as, as you could get if you went and, say, loaned uh, directly to a business at some rate, you know, determined by prime or, or something that uh, you feel is the appropriate interest rate. So it's a lower interest rate, but it's there, it, it's been working, and it's already allowed. So while equity has been taking every bit of attention about the, in the, in the crowdfunding conversation, uh, debt crowdfunding has been quietly funding businesses. So, uh, and then we were, as Cameron mentioned, uh, winners of the Points of Light uh, Civic X Accelerator at Cohort 2. And then Cohort 1 had this amazing company called Small Knot, uh, which was that same idea, but with the twist of being in your neighborhood. So if you have a coffee shop that uh, wants to expand or uh, a new, I don't know, a new local clothier that wants to open up that if you want that business in your neighborhood, then you can have a platform that's designed specifically to help you connect with your neighbors to fund that business. Okay, so those are the two sort of models that have existed for a while now. Perks crowdfunding is a dinosaur in internet terms. Debt has been around for a few years, but the one that's sort of exciting everybody at this point is equity. And that is basically um, allowing large numbers of people to invest very small amounts of money into your company uh, with a lot of restrictions and asterisks. Um, and it's a work in progress. Um, the lobbying for it began, I think, in 2010, and it was signed by Congress in 2011, um, but then Obama signed it April 2012, and just next month, we're actually seeing the final piece of it. So it's the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act, brilliantly named <laughs> by whomever had the foresight to call it the Jobs Act when the conversation was about jobs, because what senator is going to say, I'm going to kill that dang Jobs Act? None. Um, yeah, so it's controversial. There are mixed feelings about it, and there are folks uh, from both sides. Um, there are boosters and there are detractors. Um, it's called, you know, by the former car czar Steve Ratner, the greatest loosening of securities regulation in modern history. And he meant that in a very bad way. Um, although, yeah, so it's worth, though, remembering what Slava says about crowdfunding, and that's that it takes down the gatekeepers. So I like to compare those quotes from, from opposite sides of the spectrum. Um, so a bit of a backstory: the The Great Depression um, caused so much havoc in the country that when they were getting around to sort of dealing with the consequences of it and trying to build protections, um, they signed the Securities Act of 33, uh, which set out the the restrictions that you can't just go and say you're selling securities in your companies in, in public. And it also uh, set the foundation for what would become known as an, incred an accredited investor. And this is somebody that has, uh, in, in the eyes of the government, enough uh, financial savvy that they don't need the federal regulations to help them um, keep their money. And for nearly eight decades, that remained unchanged, um, it, restrictions ebbed and flowed, but the idea that you would invest in a small business uh, at scale with a small amount of money and not a lot of wealth uh, was something that was never really challenged until the signing of the Jobs Act in April of 2012. Um, and it's worth noting that that was written and um, enacted, it's being enacted in titles. So there are six total titles. One and a few of the, the higher titles were enacted immediately upon the signing, but they're not the ones that we think of when we think of uh, what's enabling equity crowdfunding. Um, next month, uh, very soon, Title II releases, and that's sort of the, the first step in what we think of when we think of the JOBS Act releasing uh, equity crowdfunding, um, making it a reality. So. 
with Title II, you basically have, uh, and there are a lot of asterisks to all of this, but you have the ability to go and publicly solicit an offering. Um, but the people who invest in that offering uh, within certain guidelines need to be still an accredited investor. And you have to do your own homework to sort of prove that they are an accredited investor. And it actually makes it a little bit harder than it used to be to demonstrate someone's an accredited investor. So lots and lots of asterisks. But the exciting part is you now have the ability as a startup in Kansas City to publicize the fact that you're raising money. And even though you can't just have somebody like a neighbor or a cousin who has a few hundred bucks to give you uh, put money in and get a security in return, uh, what you do have is the ability to sort of flesh out the um, mysterious world of accredited investors that it'd be far harder to get a hold of or to get your offering in front of if you weren't able to just go and publicly solicit it. So if you post your offering on Facebook, you know, maybe you have 500 friends and maybe only five of them are uh, accredited or know somebody that is, but the fact that you're now a single hop away from them um, is very powerful. Um, soon, <laughs> we say summer 2014 with a question mark because Title II was supposed to release uh, much earlier this year. Title III will release, and that is basically raising up to a million dollar round in a year from anyone. So a minimum of $100 buy-in, uh, up to, I think, 2,000 investors total. And you're able to do this. And this is very different from how you were capitalizing startups before. So why is that exciting? If we start thinking, if we look at some, some key metrics here, we see, like, in the U.S., um, IPOs in aggregate in 2012 uh, raised a total of $41 billion. Um, and that's a huge number. That's a massive number that, um, yeah, that's, that's, I, I would like to have that. You know, that's a good number. <laughs> I, uh, but it is dwarfed by the total amount of disposable income held by U.S. households, which is on the rise. And it's something in the order of $12 trillion in 2013. Uh, this is obviously not to scale, uh, because it would have to be 300 times the size of that little dot. But you can see that there is real potential in unleashing a huge section of that $12 trillion and enabling people who didn't used to have the opportunity to invest in uh, startups at the early stage to quote unquote get in on the ground floor of these deals the opportunity to do that. So that's very exciting. It's also, it's also, even though it's jumpstart our business startups, it's also worth mentioning that it's not just for startups. The, the, the legislation that ended up making it into what became known as the Jobs Act was sort of this stew of dozens of uh, pieces of bills and wish lists from various uh, industry folks and experts and among them is the idea that you can also release, you can loosen some of the Sarbanes-Oxley restrictions on what are now being termed emerging growth companies. And if you're under a billion dollars in market cap and you have less than a billion dollars in debt issued, um, you can offer general solicitations um, and treat it as something like a mini IPO or a pre-IPO um, and raise up to $50 million doing this. So that's also something uh, worth noting because there are a lot of companies uh, that meet those guidelines in Kansas City um, that aren't quite ready to make the, the plunge into an IPO but are in need of some growth capital. Okay, so you'll see in at the end of September a flurry of new platforms that release, that open their doors, um, not to everyone just yet, but uh, to the extent that Title II allows them to. You'll see probably hundreds of such platforms. And I chose out of the, the dozens or so that are kind of making good waves in the market right now, two to hold up as examples uh, of what you might expect to see. One is, um, as Cameron mentioned in his, uh, 
his blog post to Kaufman about this, that you'll see a specialization of platforms. Here's one uh, that's going to make use of certain pieces of the JOBS Act uh, to open up a new model of investing in real estate. And I had a conversation with them earlier this week. They're based in DC and they've already funded millions of dollars worth of real estate through this model, through their system, through uh, private placements. And what they're going to unleash, I think, will rewire the real estate industry. It's pretty amazing. So their Fundrise, that's an example of something that's going to happen that's a specialized platform that's saying, you know, it's, it's equity in a deal, but it's, it's not in a, like a tech startup or a healthcare startup. It's, it's in real estate. It's in brick and mortar. So here we see crowdfunding getting ready to rewire even this, uh, the world of brick and mortar. Um, another platform, and this one is very general. This one is designed to help tech startups reach investors through crowdfunding. This is WeFunder, and they've been there since more or less the beginning. In full disclosure, I'm buddies with one of the founders. We went to school together, but I'll tell you this, their heart is in the right place, and they were at the Jobs Act signing, and they were part of uh, getting the, the Jobs Act into existence. So they've been in Y Combinator. Um, they've had huge traction with uh, a lot of the main staple investors in Silicon Valley and they deserve every bit of it because they're wanting genuinely to fulfill their mission, which is, um, don't quote me, but it's, uh, they want to help anyone, give, give anyone the opportunity to invest in a startup regardless of wealth. And so what does it look like? Here's an example company that they uh, were funded, funding in their beta, which was a closed door uh, private placement test run and they funded this uh, with a few dozen folks who met the accredited uh, accreditation requirements and um, without going and making a public offering or a public solicitation, they were able to help fund this company. And you, it's what you would expect. It's like a Kickstarter where you're, you know, somebody telling the story of what you're doing or what you're trying to do, um, only it gives you things like term sheets and um, you know, members of the management and so forth, S the questions that you would need to ask if you were seriously considering it. And I use them as an example when I talk about equity crowdfunding because they've spent a lot of time and energy thinking about the nitty gritty specifics of why of, or of how to approach this to answer some of the harder questions that are being posed about uh, this new type of investment. And one of the, like for example, I, I give this as an example, but uh, one of the concerns of institutional investors and folks in the world of VC um, is that follow-on rounds will be extremely difficult and almost a uh, non-starter if you have to answer to 2,000 prior investors um, who each put in a few hundred or a few thousand dollars. So. The guys that we funder have helped to pioneer a model of investing in the startup uh, investment instrument. So, to spin up an LLC um, that gives all of that people invest in, and they surrender their vote by proxy, uh, so that it's a single voting entity that invests whatever they end up raising, um, which solves the issue. So. That's just one example. I highly encourage you, if you want to learn more about the nitty gritty, to go to wefunder.com and even just browse through their frequently asked questions and, and you'll see like a, a gold mine of, of these types of things. So that's all I have um, for the intro to crowdfunding. Uh, thank you very much for your time and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm right here, so. Who's got a question for Jace? Yeah, do you have any idea how these, how these platforms are going to handle that investor accreditation requirement? Yeah, it's going to vary by platform. But the platforms themselves are being regulated um, kind of heavily by uh, the SEC, who's probably going to source it to FINRA, the, the job of, of regulating them. 
and it's going to be through self-reporting. And they have to have forms built in that help validate an investor's claim that they have, they've met the requirements. And the requirements change with the JOBS Act. And I'm not sure of the specifics, but it used to be it's currently a million dollars in assets or you've made, I think, 200000 as a household for the last two years trailing, something to that effect. And before, you know, that was basically like, here, fill out our paper worksheet and say those things, and then, yeah, that's basically, you're accredited, awesome. With the new, there is actual accreditation process, so it is going to be something that uh, comes into play, but only temporarily, right? Because Title II, is you know public solicitation of accredited investors um, with the burden of proof of accreditation on the startup raising the money, um, but Title Three is basically eliminating um, that. Not eliminating. I mean, there are still lots of levels that you can invest at uh, as an accredited investor that you can't as a non-accredited under the Title Three, uh, but it's a temporary problem. Jace, I'll take moderator's privilege on the next one. So do you think that the SEC is sort of shooting themselves in the foot by kind of making it somewhat legal for accredited investors only and then by allowing everybody next summer? Point being, they can only protect investors so much. There's, pro there's going to be some sort of fraud here. Are the, are the negative stories going to come out too much to where uh, it's, it's, not even, it's not ever going to happen next summer? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Ah, that's a great one. It's not, I don't, I don't think it's a bad move to sort of, they proceeded with caution and they built sort of interim steps that helped them to release the, you know, the, the full sweep of, of what this thing entails in, in incremental stages that they can sort of sit around and measure and monitor and, and feedback onto and adjust course with, but they've introduced uh, with the passage of Act two, this uh, section on bad actors that prevents uh, folks who are known con people, uh, felons, and so forth from asking for money. Um, and the fact that it's only accredited investors and they have to kind of prove that they are, and somehow, you would, in theory, they've had the sort of financial acumen to get where they are. I mean, that's not the case, but. Um, if they're able to show that they make that much money or that they have that much in assets and they're limited by the Jobs Act and how much they can put in, um, it's such a small percentage of their overall assets that they're supposed to have that um, I don't think anybody's going to lose their home in, fa in Title II, in the Title II era, but as with anything, yeah, there will be abuse, and but I think the momentum is so strong in favor of this happening that that stuff is going to sort of just kind of, you know, get shuffled to the back of the conversation. So. We have time for one more question specifically for Jace. And remember, we'll get a chance at him at the end, too. Anybody else? Okay, Jace is too uh, humble to mention this, but if you haven't looked at Neighborly yet, it's a really cool platform. I'll bet you money there's a project in your neighborhood right now that you guys might want to participate in. Might be a great way to get started with your own crowdfunding uh, efforts. Uh, so do do take a look and check it out. So before we introduce the trailer, guys, I want to take a minute and show you uh, if, if you're not familiar with some of the um, crowdfunding campaigns that are out there, I want to show you this one uh, because I just think it really illustrates several points that I think our trailer guys are going to make. Uh, so with that, this one's called... Um, what is it for a serious artist? A Kickstarter for a serious artist. So let's watch that for just two minutes. Hello everyone. My name is Whitfield and I'm an artist living and working out of Austin, Texas. This is my first Kickstarter project and it marks my first step into the process of becoming a professional artist. The name of my project is Our Fathers and it's a series of highly detailed charcoal and graphite drawings of the Milky Way galaxy's most captivating celestial bodies. I've been passionate about artwork for nearly 20 years now. I've been thinking about art, drawing and painting for as far back as I can possibly remember. Recently I've been creating artwork for my own home and I've had a lot of people express interest in my work. I've done some work for some friends and family and I've really enjoyed it. I would love to continue doing this but on a more professional basis and that is exactly where Kickstarter comes in. 
Kickstarter provides me with the perfect platform to take my artwork into that professional space by creating artwork for you, my potential backers. So, whether you support the project or not, thanks for stopping by and checking out my video. As you can see, my primary interest is in drawing. I'm most comfortable with pencils and drawing sticks, and my preferred style is a style that is often referred to as photorealism. Artists like Chuck Close, Ralph Goings, and Richard Estes are some of the most celebrated artists of this genre. And in addition to being drawn to photorealism, I've always been captivated by black and white imagery. Owning and collecting original artwork is a lot of fun, but it can be really expensive. Artwork even from local galleries typically runs you thousands of dollars per piece. So part of my goal here has been to create unique, very high quality original artwork that is totally affordable. Most of the stuff that I've created runs just under 200 to just over 200. And that includes all costs, <laughs> shipping, framing, all of my supplies, and the creation of the work itself. Now my goal is for the project to fund, but I really want it to completely sell out. And that way I'll send out over 70 works of art to the first 70 people who buy them all over the country. I have the time, the energy, and the ability to do it. Thank you so much again for checking out my video. Have a good day, and goodbye. Okay, so I thought that lightened the mood a little bit, uh, but, but I do think it, inter it uh, illustrates an interesting point is that, in a good sense, anybody can do this. In a scary sense, anybody can do this, right? I mean, this guy, uh, my buddy's name is Whitfield. This guy could have raised, you know, thousands, millions of dollars doing this um, and probably would have taken a lot of people for a ride. Um, but at the same time, to, to our previous discussion, this is exactly what the SEC is, is worried about. Um, I, I just want to kind of lighten the mood with that a little bit. Um, but it also, uh, uh, and we'll talk about this too, the, the rise of video in these pitches in these campaigns is actually huge, and I think you have some data on this, that if you do a video, it's exponentially more successful versus not doing a video, so, no? No, okay. <laughs> I've heard that, I don't know if that's even true. Okay, so before I get into this hole any deeper, let me introduce Claude and Jason from Trelly, and uh, they're gonna talk to us about their very successful Kickstarter campaign, and uh, one of the things I, I want you guys to be thinking about as you watch uh, their presentation is the specifics on and, and one of the overarching reasons we wanted to do this is crowdfunding is definitely something that's new. It's still emerging. A lot of people have had a lot of success with it. And I don't want Kansas City to be left behind. I want our entrepreneurs, I want our ecosystem, our, our group of people who are even thinking about starting a company to understand the implications it could potentially have right from the get-go. And so I want, I want Trelly to kind of tell their story from the specific point of we were a Kansas City company, we quit our day jobs, we went all in, and this was one of the ways that we decided to fund our company. So with that, Claude and Jason from Trelly. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Cameron. So I, <clears throat> I'm Jason Reed. This is my co-founder, Claude Aldridge. Uh, as Cameron mentioned, we did quit our day jobs uh, just about a year ago or so and uh, utilized uh, Kickstarter as one of our launches uh, into market. So uh, we'll tell you a little bit about our story. Um, just real quick on us, uh, our vision is really to revolutionize technology for women and their families to increase peace of mind, uh, increase time, and to really help communication uh, amongst those that uh, they love. So uh, our first product, uh, as we become a company, but our first product was really uh, put out there. We used Kickstarter to kind of launch who we are and what we're doing. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what Kickstarter is. I won't spend a lot of time. Uh, probably most of you in here understand what it is, but I'll give you a little bit of, uh, or we'll give you a little bit of some of the nuances uh, within Kickstarter throughout uh, our presentation. Uh, why we did it specifically, uh, kind of our journey, the outreach, and then some of the key takeaways that we got uh, as we continue through the Kickstarter process uh, today. So Kickstarter, what is it? So Jace told you a little bit about some of the funds, uh, crowdsourcing or crowdfunding platforms out there. Kickstarter is one of them. Uh, there's also ones such as Indiegogo that we'll hear more about today. Uh, gosh, uh, pure backers, uh, co-fundos, there's tons of them that keep popping up on a day-to-day on a -day basis, but it's really a simple way for uh, uh, 
new companies or even current companies to go launch themselves out to the market and a way to raise awareness as well as money uh, for their specific products. Uh, we actually did uh, product design, so that was the specific category that we went uh, into, but you, within Kickstarter you can do music, you can do film, you can do graphic design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the things that they don't let you do is anything illegal, so can't do that, uh, can't do any sort of uh, drugs or sex or any of the things that uh, would seem like normal, but uh, you can't do that on... Uh, <laughs> That you can't do that on Kickstarter. Some of the other websites will actually let you do some of that stuff. And uh, so anyway, so if you're doing those sorts of things, even real estate, there was a real estate one up there. So you can't do uh, real estate either. So there's a whole list of things you can do and a whole list of things you can't do. So just be aware with Kickstarter specifically, um, some of those things. Project links, they go from one day to 60 days. Uh, I think Nate will have some data or maybe not about this, but uh, typically, 30 days is, is the range that the most successful ones do, 30 to 45 days. We actually chose the 30 days. And uh, it's, it's not an equity play. So this is really about uh, offering kind of your wares or your product or whatever it is that you're offering and having rewards uh, around it. And it's all or none. So uh, unlike some of the other uh, sites out there, you set a goal. Uh, it's a goal that you choose on your own by whatever measures or whatever reason that you want, you choose and set a goal, and then if you don't hit that goal, then the, the uh, project doesn't get funded. So no one gets any rewards, and you can actually start over. There's been some that have set pretty high uh, dollar figures out there and have not been successful, and they've actually come back months later and resubmitted and been able to uh, get funded. So a little bit about Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter... And, and, and why we personally did it. So I think there, there's really four main reasons of, of why we did it uh, personally. One was really to create buzz and launch awareness of, of Trelli and what we're doing out there. Um, we, we felt at the time we quit our jobs, we'd done one, one million cubs, we've done some stuff within the Kansas City area, but we really hadn't gone out and communicated of, uh, to, to people what we were doing and who Trelli was all about. So for us, it was truly a way uh, no pun intended, but to kickstart uh, Trelle, our product, our vision, everything we're doing. So that was one of the really the main reasons why we did it. The second reason is really to start to validate the market. So you'll see a lot of people out there putting their wares out or their products out to really get validation. For us, it was really key. Uh, again, I'll defer to Nate on this, but a lot of uh, the research that we've seen shows that Kickstarter skews pretty heavily to young uh, males. And our target audience for our first product is not young males. It was, as I mentioned, kind of in our, um, st as I started, our vision is really around women and their families. So this is really a way for us to validate and kind of go against the grain of what the typical Kickstarter person is. So we wanted to get out there and start to validate the market. Um, next piece, obviously, is money. It's great to have money. The more money, the better. So we wanted to uh, get some money, and specifically our money that we went to raise was to go uh, pay for our plastic injection molding tools and to kind of help start launch and our product. The third thing is really to get a captive audience, so people out there really supporting what we're doing, uh, and not only for the project now, but as we've moved through su successfully funding and working on um, additional products down the road, and, and getting products out there, uh, we now have a captive audience that's there and we're, we're able to capture all that data as we communicate for them to, to them uh, on an ongoing basis, good, bad, or indifferent back and forth. So it's really capturing the data. Uh, we chose Kickstarter over the others. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of them out there, specifically because of, at the time, the popularity. Kickstarter was really more known, at least within our group or the people that we knew of, and partially because of the paper or e-paper watch uh, by Pebble that had just come out was receiving a lot of press. So it wasn't really anything other than that, that the popularity of that site at the time uh, was trending very high. So we chose that one uh, specifically over the other um, sites. So a little bit about our journey, and I will uh, explain what this picture means uh, uh, in a minute. but. Uh, we talked to a lot of people before we started to get a kind of an idea of the level of effort um, 
that that running a campaign might might take. Has anybody in the room done a Kickstarter project or done a crowdfunding project or getting ready to do one? Okay, so uh, it'll take twice as much time as you think it's going to take, and it's like having a kid. You never realize how much time it's going to take or anything else until it actually happens to you. So I'm giving you a fair warning. It'll take you way, way more time than you ever imagined, so just keep that in mind when you're working at 4 o'clock in the morning and things still aren't done. So um, we actually signed up uh, for Kickstarter in October of last year. Uh, we set up our bank accounts, set up the accounts with Amazon, set up a lot of pieces uh, ahead of time to go do this. Uh, we shot a video. Uh, videos can run from very elaborate videos to very simple with just somebody talking, similar to the spoof that we, we saw uh, a few minutes ago. So uh, we kind of went in the middle, but we did hire somebody to actually professionally shoot the video for us, to go through the script, uh, to do all those sorts of things. We also had people taking pictures. Uh, we had to develop all the content that went to the site itself. We had to uh, create our own story on everything. So all that stuff, while it's in your mind and it seems very easy and what we thought it would be, actually getting it down to make it very simple and concise and to the point uh, takes quite a long time, as well as figuring out what's your funding, how, how much money you're trying to raise, the reason behind that, and then really understanding the number of re rewards that you're going to push out there. All the rewards need to be associated with what your project is uh, or your product that you're producing. We went out the door with 11 rewards. Um, as we went through the project, we actually added more rewards to entice people uh, because there were some ones that were really popular and wanted to spice things up. Uh, in hindsight, I think we probably did too many rewards. It got pretty out of hand at the end. Uh, and now that uh, I'm fulfilling all those rewards, it's uh, still out of hand, but uh, it was a way to try to go and uh, get as many people as possible, sp specifically around different um, levels. So we did everything from a $2 up to, I think our highest was 1500 2000 So we had kind of everything in between there. Uh, so we, we tried to hit, hit all the audiences uh, with that. Again, we did a product design, so we had to have a working prototype, so we had to do uh, videos showing that working prototype actually working, uh, and, and that was just all before even getting and submitting to Kickstarter. So we shot our video in December, uh, anticipating that we were actually gonna launch in December. We decided to wait, specifically we were getting too close to the holiday season, didn't wanna get into all the different uh, buzz that was going on with the holidays. And so we planned our PR campaign and, and our launch uh, a little bit after Christmas. So we submitted, uh, I think, December 25th or 23rd, right before Christmas. And here's where this hurry up and wait uh, actually happens. So we planned our launch date, I think, uh, January 4th, uh, somewhere around there. We had a PR lined up for that. Uh, and then we went into a black hole. And granted, it's Christmas time. so. That's, we, we kind of gave ourselves the time for that. But then a week later, we were still in a black hole and hadn't heard anything back from Kickstarter, which was uh, very concerning since we had all this stuff uh, set up and ready to launch on a, on a national level. Uh, then we got a response back saying we were declined and uh, listed a number of different reasons. And um, so they've made these changes where you can offer multiple products, which is very frustrating to uh, actually our audience who wanted to buy multiple, so two trellies or three trellies or four trellies. And so on their site, they actually allowed us, they say you could put up to um, uh, purchasing 10. Well, what the fine print is, if you, if you allow uh, them to buy, hopefully this makes sense, if you can buy as a reward or get as a reward one, object, you can't then also offer that object in threes or fours or fives. So there's these little nuances there that were very frustrating to our crowd um, in hindsight um, or afterwards, but we had to go fix those things. Well, so we replied back and got that fixed very quickly uh, and then again into a black hole. And so we spent two months working on this, three months working on this and continued to be in this black hole with PR. Uh, lined up to go launch with us. 
so we got that fixed uh, multiple emails later. They don't have a, a phone number that you can call into. Uh, they don't have emails that you can email into. You're literally in this, um, I guess, inbox that goes to the customer service. So we got that fixed, and they came back and said, well, you, you, you can't do something else. Uh, so we fixed that. And then again, two days later, went back into a, a black hole, never heard anything back, pinged them again and again and again. And then finally, they came back, and then we were able to, to launch the project. So uh, I, all, all that to be said, those guys are, it's not to bash Kickstarter necessarily, but it was a very frustrating process when, when we were ready to go launch and um, with the two to three day turn, turnaround that they have on their website, um, as what they say they will turn around with, just be very aware that it may take you a lot longer uh, than, than that. And again, they're a startup in their own right, so they have a lot of process to work through, but uh, it was quite frustrating to us uh, to be able to get this, this project actually launched and out the door. Uh, so uh, other than that, the one thing I did forget to mention and to take into consideration is when you're signing up, Kickstarter actually takes 5% of what you raise uh, and they do all their back-end um, I guess monetization through Amazon.com, and Amazon also takes a fee out of that uh, in the 3 to 5% range. So I just wanted you guys to also be aware that there are fees associated with uh, the project, uh, assuming it's successful. If it's not successful, no fees are charged. So... Um, I've got a couple different things to talk about, but I wanted to add um, two points. I think um, I, I don't want to underemphasize the fact that we did the crowdfunding because in you know our opinion, there's no downside. So if you don't get funded, you're no worse off, right? You probably learned a lot about your product or your company or your you know whatever you're you're doing on there, and it doesn't cost you money. So you know, do it and like Jason said, you can do it more than once. If, so if you fail and you screw up and you learn some stuff, you can tweak it and go back to the well or go to a different service and, and you win. And that hap that's actually happened a lot where somebody will fail on one platform and they'll go repackage it and put it on another platform and they'll get successfully funded. So um, for us, there is no downside. Um, the, the other thing I would add is um, Jason was being nice uh, when talking about our experience with Kickstarter, it was very frustrating, and you know I'm sure that they're making strides and 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 such. But um, you know I think it's fair to say that they are kind of a startup in their own right, and so you just need to be prepared to deal with the things that come along with that. So maybe processes that haven't been fully vetted or things they're still figuring out or things that they're trying that are new and they don't know if they're going to work or not. And, and that's what we kind of ran into. And, and once again, we did this back in February. So I'm, I'm guessing things have continued to, you know, get better and, and uh, they've, we're not the first people to give them, you know, the feedback we just shared. So um, I, I think probably one of the key points or key takeaways, uh, if you hear nothing else that we say today is, um, and w you know, we've, we've heard this from people that, you know, um, ask us about our experience on Kickstarter um, is, and this is the first thing we say is, this is not field of dreams, meaning just because you build it or put it up on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or whatever, does not mean people will come find you and buy your product and, and support you. Right, it's just, it's not that easy. And, and frankly, I think the stats um, that Nate will have uh, will we'll bear that out. I mean, it's, uh, m most of the failures are, you know, kind of, you know, frankly, naive uh, people and companies and such that, you know, throw a great, maybe a great idea up there, but they didn't think about the outreach that it takes behind the scenes to make it go. And so um, I think that's probably the first and foremost thing. You may have the greatest invention since sliced bread, but if you don't have the preparation behind the scenes, it doesn't, it's not gonna matter. I mean, they're not just gonna find you. And I, and I will say that video that Cameron showed was extremely funny, but I, I was cringing on the inside because um, one of the ways to get some traction during your, your crowdfunding campaign is if the editors, so the Kickstarter editors, 
pick you for the editor's page, right? They basically put you on the front page saying, hey, we think this is really cool, you ought to check it out, which can really help your numbers. Unfortunately, we can never make it to page one because we are outdone by um, two editor's picks. One was a whale stapler. It was a stapler shaped like a whale. And the other one was uh, zombie, pet zombie rocks. And, and I'm not kidding. I, we, we couldn't make it to the front page to get that traction because we were outdone by those guys. So that's, I, that's as much as I'll say about that. All right, so we're running a little short on time, so I'll speed it up here. Um, as, as I mentioned, you know, we, we knew a little bit about what we were getting ourselves into, so we put a lot of work into uh, making sure we had, um, you know, aggregated um, our contacts. So we had four or five people that we all combined our address books and, and you know, kind of to our benefit, um, we may be a little bit older than some of the traditional startup companies, um, so we had, you know, time to kind of build our network in Kansas City. We're both born and raised Kansas City, and the people that work for us are similar, and so, you know, we had a pretty good network um, going, especially locally, going into this, which, which I think really helped us. Um, and uh, secondly, you know, what, um, that, that's not enough, so starting with a, a good network is great, right? Um, and, but it takes, it's, it's more than just blasting out an email saying, hey, we're on Kickstarter, you know, please support us, we quit our jobs, and, you know, um, and that works for some people, because you get a lot of WTF, you know, responses back, you quit your job, you did what? Uh, and some people appreciate that, and they, they back you just for that reason, but, but for the most people, you have to remember, they have no idea what Kickstarter is, and, and to this day, still have no idea what Kickstarter is. You have to, we learned that the hard way. We started talking about, we're on Kickstarter, and, and you know, we're, my grandma's calling me like, what are you talking about? And, um, and so that's the first thing, don't assume, just because we, we're close to the space that other people know what you're talking about when you're talking about crowdfunding or Indiegogo or Kickstarter or whatever. You, you, gotta, you gotta assume people know nothing and start with the basics and go from there. Um, the other thing is, uh, we found that you know, for the most part, unless you're selling, trying to sell something for like $200, people are willing to support you, absolutely. I mean, lifelong friends, family, friends of friends, people just want to support, I mean, we've seen it in Kansas City in general, right? People just want to support startups, and, and this is an easy way to do it. Um, however, we found, and maybe it's just our network, but I think it probably applies to everybody, is you have to continually remind people to go out and do that and make it as easy as possible for them to do that. And so, you know, kind of in the middle of our campaign, which is the really hard part, because you get a big launch and you get a big finish, but the middle is where you gotta keep it going. We were reaching out personally to people, you know, one off on email and, and phone calls and whatever, and just saying, hey, you know, no pressure, but y y you told us you thought what we were doing is cool, but we'd really, we need you to go buy this, and we've only got a few days left, and, and that really helped us too. So, I, you know, that goes back to the work that Jason was talking about, but I think that's absolutely true is, you know, the more you invest, the more you're going to get out of it. And I think that's one of the reasons we were successful. Um, we out of time? All right, real quick, we're out of time. So we're, shit, we're fulfilling our Kickstarter re uh, orders today. We just got our first inventory. We're, we built these overseas, and so that, that was a process in and of itself. So we're sending these out right now, and so far we've got a lot of feedback, good and bad, which is absolutely what we wanted, and one of the benefits of doing it through Kickstarter is the people realize they're buying your product kind of probably before it's even ready, and so therefore, you know, they understand if there's some flaws and stuff, in your, most people understand there's flaws and things in your, in your uh, product. Uh, real quick, um, and, and this goes to what Jace was talking about. I was supposed to stick to what our experience was on Kickstarter, but I will, I will put my two cents in on the, uh, the crowdfunding for equity. So we sold product, but now you're gonna be able to sell equity through the Jobs Act. I would say that based on our experience with the people that backed us that we didn't know on Kickstarter um, and the neediness of them wanting information on almost a daily basis about what's going on and why, why is this delayed and how could this happen and tell me more. Um, you're asking, you're asking for it if you sell equity in your company through a crowdfunding platform when that's available. And, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying be prepared. Because you know, this was a you know, $30 product people were buying. If you're selling $200 in your company, those people are gonna want a lot of information on a regular basis about your company. So I, I would put that 
my two cents in there. Um, let's see, so it takes a lot of time. We had uh, backers in 22 countries, so our split, I said we, we started with our network, and I read somewhere the other day that if you, you need to um, uh, basically, you know, have your, your internal network lined up, so, it, you know, make sure you can get 20% of your funding goal from your network. I don't know how you validate that, but that's what the suggestion was. Um, but we had about a 60-40 split, so our network was about 60% and 40% was outside of our network, which was awesome. And those people came from 22 different countries and all over the United States. And um, that's a really validating feeling to know that people that, you know, you didn't make a personal ask to are, are willing to buy this. And that's one of the reasons you do something like this. Um, and, and I think the last thing, and, and this is what I think everybody, not everybody, a lot of people get wrong. You don't do this for the money. Um, yes, there are the outliers, the e pebbles, and, and you know, um, the misfit shines, and these really cool projects that go over a million dollars. But the vast majority are like ours. We 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 made, you know, we got thirty five thousand dollars, which was outstanding, but it was never going to be, you know, a two million dollar heyday. And and sure, you you hope like, don't don't get me wrong. I had those, you know grand vision of, you know, I wake up the next morning after we launched it and we've got five million in the bank. But, um, but the reality is you don't do it for the money. You do it for the PR. It gave us a really good excuse to go talk to our friends and family about what we were doing and get the word out about, you know, these crazy guys that, that quit their jobs to go build technology for women. And, um, and that was valuable by itself. So the money is just bonus. I think that to Jace's, you know, pie deal, it's just, it's the icing. So, Keep that in mind, and uh, I think uh, that is it. Oh, I, I, the other thing I would say is, we just had an incident the other day that, um, uh, just keep in mind that y you never know who's buying uh, your product and who's seeing this stuff. And so we had a, a, you know, a senior vice president from one of the big you know, OEMs um, who bought our product, and we didn't know that until we were communicating with this person over email about our, he, he received his package and whatever, and we looked them up and sure enough, it's like this guy that couldn't be more perfect for our company as far as visibility or partnerships or potential acquisition. And, and, and so we laughed because we had no idea. And so I, would, I think it was just a good stop and take a look around and realize there are people that are backing you that, um, that's their way to track the progress in your company, which is a great thing from an investor standpoint, from a partnership standpoint, and from a you know later down the road acquisition standpoint. So, let's thank the guys from Trelly. Now, my first question is: Did you guys bring a Trelly with you? Uh -oh. You forgot it. You forgot it. Okay, sorry. Um, one of the points I want to reiterate that they made, I actually contributed to this. It was my first ever Kickstarter. And one of the things, after, after the, the, um, the crowdfunding period closed, I get an email from them. And it's asking very specific questions. Okay, where do I need to mail this, right? Even though I think I'd already entered that when I, when I first started out. And then it was all these questions. Where would you buy a product like this? How much would you expect to pay for it? How many products would you buy at a time? Things like that. So it goes back to that validating your customer and validating who is going to buy your product, where are they going to buy it. So as they started thinking out their strategy, this was really helpful data for them that they were able to get from people who had already had skin in the game, had already put money down to buy their particular product, already liked it enough to buy it, and then they were just trying to tap into that from more of a survey perspective. Um, I think we have time for one question. Can you talk a little bit about sales tax what, of the 35K? How does that work with your sales and your, and your uh, rewards? This is a sore subject, Steve. <laughs> uh, we are dealing with that right now. Uh, so I, I don't think, Kickstarter takes a pretty laid back approach on what they advise on. They basically say you need to go get advice from professionals on tax and legal and all that stuff. Uh, essentially, I think, um, and I'm no expert either, but you pay tax on the stuff that you ship within your own state where your company's based. So we're in Kansas, so anybody that bought, that backed us in Kickstarter that's in Kansas, their shipping address is in Kansas, we will end up covering their state of Kansas sales tax. 
Um, everybody else, I think it's legally um, on them to report that when they do their taxes uh, at, at the end of the year, like you would if you bought something on Amazon. Um, I, I don't think that's really mass adopted yet, but that's how it's supposed to work. Does that answer your question? Okay, we're going to jump right into Nate Allen with our third piece, third and final piece today. Uh, he's going to tell us what Kickstarter data looks like from some data that he was able to scrape. And, uh, and I'll just go ahead and give a plug. We're, we're, um, he also did a very compelling presentation that was posted on Silicon Prairie News a couple of weeks ago. Is that right? So if you wanted to check it out or get more, um, I'll try to find the link and tweet it out. Uh, there's a link at the end. Link at the but end. Tweet it even, out. even better. Okay, cool. Nate Allen. Hi, everybody. Um, so we um, are running a little bit late. Okay, so we've got 20 minutes left. So I'm going to actually kind of run through this. It's probably good, all the exposition that I like to just talk about myself. I'm going to have to cut it all out. So um, yeah, so we're going we're gonna to look at Kickstarter um, just from some numbers that I've collected. Uh, so I run a company called Four First Names. We help companies communicate data. If you've got a bunch of data that when you try and tell somebody about it, their eyes cross, that's when you call me. So, um, so this is all just uh, publicly scraped by a program that I wrote. It just visits the website thousands of times, uh, looks at the page, scrapes numbers off of it. So we have things like how many backers did they get? What was their goal? How much did they actually raise? What category were they? What were the rewards they were offering? So that's all in a database. Um, then I had a bunch of questions. And I wanted to see if the data that I had would answer them. So um, the, the set that we're working from is a couple months old. I haven't done a scrape in a couple months. Um, but it's got a lot of big numbers in it. So 640,000 rewards across 87,000 projects and about 6 million pledges across 3 million backers. Uh, so the premise that, that I was kind of working from when I started exploring this data is that there are failed campaigns that could have been successful. So let's assume that there are some things that just they didn't have a chance, they weren't offering anything that people wanted, they asked for more money than they were ever going to get. But let's assume that there is a subset of projects that if they just would have changed their behavior, they, they would have been successful. Um, there are a couple things that I just wasn't able to collect. Um, I don't know how much each person pledged. I only know how many people collected rewards. And so we're sort of assuming pledge amounts based on the reward they collected. But you are allowed to pledge more than the reward you claimed. So the, the data might be a little bit fuzzy. Don't have anything on the video. I know Cameron mentioned it. I don't have the duration. I don't know if it was funny or serious. I don't know what the production quality was. Uh, and traffic, I suspect, is very important. But we can't look at it as in how many people visited the page versus actually clicked the button to pledge. So that's what we're working with. So let's define success. If we want to know what a more successful project is, we got to know what success is. Kickstarter doesn't allow you to keep your money unless it's successful. I think Jason and Claude mentioned that. Um, if you tweet about me, it'll show up, apparently. Um, so uh, the success rate of projects on Kickstarter from its inception to when I last collected the data is about 44% less than half of projects actually hit their goal and collect their money. Uh, and that's been pretty steady since the beginning. If you graph it over time, um, projects are always kind of hovering around that 50% mark uh, in success rate. Um, so the first thing that you can do um, is not ask for too much money. So this is um, all of the projects that asked for $100 or less, almost no money. 74% of them hit their goal. But it continues to decrease as you ask for more money, up to if you're asking for over $100,000, only 9% of those projects are actually going to be successful. Um, I'm also going to try and show sort of the outliers, the things that don't fit the data, the one-offs. Uh, the first one I wanted to show, uh, the Springfield, Missouri Hemp Fest, which tried to raise $1 was unsuccessful. <laughs> um, but not to, not to dog on Springfield, they actually had a very successful video game named Delver's Drop. And they raised, uh, I think, over 50000 So it's, it's not a Springfield thing. Uh, but it's a Springfield Hemp Fest thing. Um, so the next question is, how many rewards should I offer? Jason already commented on this, uh, that the more rewards you offer, the more 
just sort of labor you're going to put into fulfilling them. But from a dollars standpoint, um, number of rewards that you offer versus dollars raised. So, um, well, let's just let's just see what the graph says. Um, it gets kind of choppy as you start offering more rewards because there are just less projects that have bothered to offer 20, 20 different reward types and up. But you can see that there's a pretty clear trend that the more money that you offer, um, the, or the more rewards that you offer, the more money you're likely to raise. That, that big spike in the data, I actually went and looked it up and there's a, a video game that happened to offer 21 rewards that raised a little over $3 million. So it kind of threw off the data a little bit. But the, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that the more you offer, the more choices you give people, the more likely they are to give to you. Um, it may be just because it looks, makes you look more legitimate. Not sure, but that's what the, the data is telling us. Um, again, fun exception. The project that had the most rewards offered uh, with 138 different reward levels was the Bourbon Derby. They were able to raise from eight people and they only got uh, about 3,000 of their 195,000. Um, but the, the project that asked for this, they had the second most with 116 different reward levels, asked for 9,000 and raised almost 300,000. So those are just a couple interesting anecdotes. How much should I ask for? So this is actually one of the more interesting things that I've found. Maybe those first two anecdotes were sort of obvious when you think about them. Um, so we're going to take a look at all of the pledges on Kickstarter across every project across all time. So this skinny bar represents every pledge that was from $1 to $50. It's really skinny because it isn't a lot of money, but it's really tall because a lot of people have pledged somewhere between $1 and $50. This next block here it's a little bit fatter. People are pledging more money. It's a little bit shorter. There are fewer people that are pledging that amount of money. We've got another, another block here between pledges between $125 and $499. Again, they're pledging more money, but there's fewer of them. And there are a few people that pledge over $500 to Kickstarter projects. Now, this in itself may not be too interesting, but each of these blocks are almost the same amount of money. And the takeaway here is that you should be offering, if you're asking for sort of above $10,000, offer rewards up to $10,000. There may be somebody out there that is willing to pay for something that's really special that you can offer. Um, what kinds of things are those? So it's word cloud time. So this is across all rewards on every project. These are the top 50 words that you see after I've taken out some is's and ands and u's and i's. Um, so the, the big obvious ones, it's really easy to give people credit, thank them, put your autograph on something, doesn't cost you anymore, costs you some time. Um, and then the next big thing, copy, DVD, CD, film, album, book. People want the thing that you're making. So these are the most popular things that people are giving out. Uh, I also wanted to show the split between successful projects and unsuccessful projects. So we're first going to look just at the low dollar rewards. These are all, these are the top 50 words for successful and unsuccessful projects in 150 or less reward levels. They're very similar. Successful and unsuccessful projects are offering about the same kind of thing at, the, at these low dollar rewards. When we split it out to the high dollar rewards, rewards that are over 150, if you stare at this for a little bit, you're going to see some words in the successful side that you don't see on unsuccessful. And they're things like travel, dinner, private, party, friend's house. It's those unique things that your backers can connect with you, that they can get closer to the project, uh, that they're willing to pay a lot more for. If you charge somebody $3,000 as a reward level, you can offer to fly them out and give them some unique experience. And people are willing to pay that. And that's one of the things that sets successful projects apart from unsuccessful projects. Um, here's, here's sort of a myth that I wanted to talk about that actually uh, Jason and Claude kind of spoke to 
Uh, the myth being I should use Kickstarter because they have the largest user base. Um, so the way that I approached this problem is I just wanted to see how many people on Kickstarter actually come back and back a second project, right? They have this huge user base of three million users. Um, is that important? Are those people coming back and looking for your project as opposed to the one they already backed? Single backers make up 76% of the user base on Kickstarter. Three quarters of the people come to Kickstarter, they back one project and they never come back. The other side of that coin though, is that they only account for 39% of the pledges. Still a pretty big chunk though. Um, I want to linger a little bit on this point. Claude already kind of did, that you can't expect that just by putting your project out on Kickstarter, people are going to find you. Kickstarter itself doesn't do a lot for discovery. Um, you have to find your audience and you have to send them there. And in some cases, based on your audience, you're going to have to teach them how to use Kickstarter. 40% um, is a pretty big chunk of your money. Um, now again, we don't know exactly how much. Maybe the people that are single backers give more money. Maybe they give less money. But I can tell you that they make up three quarters of the user base and about 40% of the pledges come from those backers. Um, there, there, here's an outlier here is the, is the person that has backed the most projects on Kickstarter. He's a French graphic designer and as of right now he's backed 1,538 projects. Um, I actually went into the data to see um, how successful if he's a kingmaker, right? Like does he know the projects that are going to be successful? The projects that he's backed have a 16% success rate. <laughs> he may actually be going in and finding projects that are going to not be successful so that he doesn't have to pay any money, but that he can keep his number up. <laughs> I don't know. I'll just tell you that he has a 16% success rate. How are we doing on time? Okay. So conclusion, um, ask for what you need and not too much more. Um, don't think that you're going to get a million dollars. Don't think that you're going to, you know, you see these things that get press and they get pressed because they are outliers. 2% uh, of projects on Kickstarter have raised over $50,000. Um, it's not a common thing. So figure out what you need to do this and then add in for tax, add in for, you know, fulfilling your rewards and ask for that amount of money and you're more likely to be successful. Offer more choices and let your backers get involved. Um, they, they have, they're backing you because they're really interested in what you're doing and let them explore that. Let them get involved. Let them drive the product. Let them, you know, give them special access because they're the ones that are making this possible for you. And BYOB, bring your own backers. Figure out who your audience is, figure out where they are, and figure out how to get them onto whatever platform it is that you're on. Um, and it may not be important that it's Kickstarter, you know? Claude, Claude and Jason kind of said the same thing, that um, they had to go and find the people themselves. So maybe do some research into different platforms and pick the one that the process is best. The rules are the best for you. Um, because you're going to be bringing your own backers. Um, we don't have time for this. I'm sorry. I really want to do the panel. I want you guys to get a chance to ask some questions. Um, but this is on my website. Uh, this is me doing a video of some more raw visualization of the data. And I actually use a Rock Band controller to do it because I'm weird like that. Um, <laughs> That, that first link at the top there, 4fn.co slash ksdata, that's going to show the video, and it's going to have the raw data. If, you're, if there's any data nerds sitting out there, that, that whole data set I talked about, 87,000 projects, 6 million pledges, you can download the whole thing and play with it. Um, or just visit our website and see what we do, uh, or get with me on Twitter. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Nate. We appreciate it. Okay, let's jump into questions. Let me get this stool up here. If you guys will come back up on stage, if you can even call this a stage, and uh, let's take questions. Mr. Shackleford. Hey, Nate. Yeah. Did you have someone who jumped in the most and had the most success? Um, like, which projects were, like... I mean, it have to be some volume of funding minimum, right? But then he was, his success rate was... Oh, yeah. Well, so there are... Uh, if you want just pure like percentage of goal raised, there are several projects that try to get one dollar, and one of them raised like twenty two hundred. So they technically got twenty two thousand percent of their goal. 
Um, but uh, the other example, I mean, Pebble's always going to be the winner, right? They asked for 100000 and got $10 million. They They raised 1,000% the of their goal. The individual that's, that's, oh. that's, in that, that's quote unquote pledge the most. Just to go see which of his projects are most successful. You find an individual that's had an 80% hit? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't gone in to see which of, which of the projects he's back. He's also not started a project, so maybe this is the long game where he's going to start a project and be like, look, I'm the most prolific backer on Kickstarter, and then we can all you know, tell the press that he's a liar. And since, since I have the mic, Trelly guys, would you do it again? A hundred percent, maybe. Would you use Kickstarter again over another platform? Hey guys, thank you so much for your time today. I'm here just to kind of learn and check it out, but I'm not leaving going, hell yeah, I want to go do that. You have not left me excited about Kickstarter. You have not left me enthusiastic about the method. Uh, I'm going, <laughs> I mean, it sounds great. Is it going to change? Is it going to grow? Is it going to get easier? Is it going to be, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm just kind of left with what? And so I tried to pay attention. I did my best, but maybe I didn't hear exactly what you were trying to tell me or, uh, but I'm interested. I'm, I'm going to go to the next event and check that out, too. And um, so I guess that's just well, more of a comment than I, anything. So I'll, I'll apologize for at least Trilly. We That was not what we were trying to convey. We just we just wanted to make sure that people understood it's a lot of work behind the scenes. You don't just throw it up there and it happens. Other than that, I think it's all upside. And, and that's that's why we said that's why I said I'd do it again. You, you don't have you have nothing to lose, right? And if you're willing to put the time and energy into it, you know, do it. Um, so I didn't mean to discourage you. Speaking for myself, I don't think these guys did either. Um, so I would encourage you to try it, and then hopefully I can be listening to you up here, you know, in six months. My build on that question is um, maybe it's not a question of should you or shouldn't you, but knowing now the effort to essentially gain awareness more than money. Um, what might you have done instead that would have been more valuable? Is there something you would have done differently that's not even the crowdfunding platform to raise awareness for the same investment of your time and money and talent? I, I, think, for, I think for us, um, although there were some issues, I, I think it was the best way to truly kickstart what we were doing. It just happened to be on Kickstarter. I don't, I don't think we would have been able to, to launch and get this much publicity much momentum and then even personally having that force us to get out there it it, it was it was an absolute nece necessity for us um i think your two cents save people if they really listen millions of dollars thank you um i want to ask the question from the standpoint of um you all offering the rewards uh uh, Nate showed that, you know, it looked like it I expected 14 and then 21 was somebody else that was uh, an anomaly. Um, <clears throat> uh, what number of rewards would you offer again? And what type did you, and I know it was your product or something like that. And then um, uh, you mentioned about the 5% that um, Kickstart takes. Now, um, Nate was talking about only offer, only get so much money. I mean, you know, don't try to get to go for the moon, but then you got to consider this 5% and this Amazon cut and all that. Did you all consider that when you all were trying to raise your money? Uh, so first, we, we did 11 to start, and then we added uh, another four or five rewards. Uh, so 15, 16 rewards total. Uh, I, I think... Now seeing the data, it makes sense for us. It was just control, and then although we aren't, we do have back personal things on on Kickstarter. Uh, the experience that we get when there's just so many rewards there, it's just very confusing for people who aren't used to backing. So that's why I, said, I don't know that we would have done as many. But seeing that data, if we do it again, we probably will, just because the data says it. Um, and then the second part of your question, oh, the money wise. Um, 
We, we definitely took that into consideration, had spreadsheets. We, we, I think we went into it as wide open, eyes wide open as we could at the time. Uh, but unless, again, the outliers, the ePebble uh, and those guys, they're actually, hopefully, they're making profit on it. Ours was just, let's cover the cost of what we needed um, not to go make profit. I mean, we didn't consider this funding. Uh, it wasn't fundraising. It was, let's go get this launch, let's cover our costs, and truly marketing of our product so it paid dividends in the end, marketing versus sales. Yeah, so you, don't, you, you just want to make sure you don't set your, your, le your price levels too low to where you're losing money because then if you are an outlier and all of a sudden you got a million backers and you're losing money on every product you're selling, that, that could be a problem. So. I'd like to know how you keep in touch with the people who do support you. Is it through a blog or is it a built-in thing in Kickstarter or do you just send random emails or, or do you have something that keeps you in contact with the people who've supported you or as your process goes? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, I've helped to build the platform. So it's partly the job of the platform to offer the toolkit for you to engage those people through updates and through uh, structured emails and to help you to understand uh, how and when to message them. And um, there's a well understood body of uh, evidence that suggests that the more frequent the updates, the more likely the project will be to hit its goal. So that engagement is a key part of it. Um, but uh, there's the problem of the, the golden hammer, right? That you, you can sit around and focus and dwell on a tool all day long and using the right tool and everything. And, but it's ultimately, uh, it comes down to um, what both of these, uh, what, what Claude and Jason and Nate alluded to, and it's that uh, there's an extraordinary amount of energy and time that you have to spend to do it. So ultimately, you're the most effective tool for those communications, and you're the only ingredient that's really essential to that. So if you're going to do it, um, just be aware that it can have the greatest tool set built into the platform for that kind of structured engagement of your followers and your backers. Uh, but it comes down to your effort that makes the difference. Qu question here in the back. I'm told by Cameron this is the last one. So I'm going to do two part. Uh, hey. This is <laughs> maximize. Um, this is probably a question for Nate. Um, crowdfunding, Kickstarter, makes a lot of sense for product-based startups. Um, but for services, I'm wondering about the, because, you know, these incentives for people to back usually are, oh, I get this reward or this product for a cheaper price. I get it early. But for services, you know, how do companies take advantage? What are the varieties of uh, rewards you've seen? And then a question for Jace. Uh, as far as equity um, crowdfunding, you were speaking, it kind of reminded me of kind of a Bitcoin pool where you have a lot of people, you know, working together for one as a group. So if, if that's the case, um, who's, the, who's the speaker, who's the voice on behalf of all these people and who gets the vote, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, yeah, I'll take the first question. Um, I, this, this question has come up and I, so the question is basically, um, the, it's great for product companies, and some people actually treat the platform as sort of a, a pre-order mechanism, right? I'm going to buy this thing uh, so that these people have money to manufacture it and get it out there. But then there's another type. Uh, you, you can raise money for a service as well, or uh, people are, you know, like say on Jace's platform, raising money um, to do something in their community. Um, I, I can't speak to sort of like the overarching data because I, there's not like a category. On, on Kickstarter, they actually specifically ask for products, projects, things that sort of have a deliverable. Um, I can say anecdotally, when I was looking through at sort of the outliers, there was a project that had a goal of $25, and it was a graphic artist out in LA. Um, and for $25, he'll build you a logo. And he put this on Kickstarter, and so he just, $25 was the reward level for like a black and white logo and then there was like 75 for a color and 125 for a color with two revisions or whatever and you would you would pay him for his services through Kickstarter so he had a $25 goal and raised you know uh, $50,000 or something and it, like over a year he filled his pipeline for a year um, just by doing that so there's there's definitely creative uses uh, of Kickstarter but to say like how it works for services versus product I, I can't really speak to from, from the data I've collected, but the equity thing. Cool, so um, 
I think your question, you're, you're referring to the example shown from WeFunder of suggesting uh, that the startups can have an LLC that's sole purpose is to invest in the startup. And in their structure, um, they're saying that up to 2,000 investors can pool together up to a million dollars, but they all surrender their vote to a proxy, which in the case of that example goes to the platform. So there's the platform and there's what's emerging as this service layer that these platforms are using to kind of try to differentiate themselves. And uh, the ones that seem to be coming out ahead are the ones that are saying, we'll help you with this aspect of what you're trying to do. So in the case of, of that example where there's the, the WeFund LLC, they're calling it, um, they get the vote. So they're imagining themselves as sort of the link between your hundred or thousand or two thousand investors and your startup. Does that answer your question? It does, but I mean that would mean that they would have to have interest in, and pay attention to appropriately put their vote to all these companies. Right? Yes. Yes. So their model I think involves uh, structured surveys uh, before upcoming meetings uh, that would help to um, you know, query the thousand or so investors in a structured way and get feedback in a structured way, and then use that to determine a vote uh, based on the, the, the what's perceived as the voter preferences. I don't think they're obligated to vote as the, as the crowd votes in that case, um, but they're trying to offer that as a value add service. That's not, that's not a, it's not a requirement on their platform, but it's there if you don't want to be in the position of uh, trying to build your company and trying to answer uh, emails from a thousand investors, like what Claude and Jason said about the just having a product and having be prepared for the amount of uh, you know engagement you're going to get from your people, which you want, uh, but it would be like drinking from a fire hose at, at the scale of a thousand investors in an equity situation. Join me in thanking these guys for their time.